So up to now we saw how mitochondrial membranes are composed and we also saw how mitochondria can change size and shape over time. Now obviously mitochondria can only be dynamic if they exist in the first place. So now we have to talk a little bit about mitochondrial biogenesis or, or how mitochondria are produced. Now originally when you think of mitochondrial biogenesis maybe you innocently think of constructing individual mitochondria but given that we just saw that mitochondria are a full network, actually mitochondrial biogenesis is a blanket term for the components being formed of mitochondria, forming more mitochondrial protein, more mitochondrial lipid, and more mitochondrial DNA. This process has to be regulated. The quantity of mitochondrial components has to be determined in some manner. First of all, because you need a minimum of mitochondria. A minimum of mitochondria is not just enough to generate enough ATP for the cell, but actually to have a little bit of a reserve energy capacity for situations in which the cell needs more ATP and can survive this energy emergency because there is some reserve capacity. However, mitochondria are not cheap to make. Synthesis has to be controlled because it can't be excessive. Mitochondria are very complex for the cell, that would be a waste of energy to have too many mitochondria. Too many mitochondria also would generate a lot of reactive oxygen species, a lot of free radicals, and generating too many mitochondria therefore is undesirable. You want to limit the quantity of oxidants generated. So mitochondrial biogenesis is a regulated process. And this is a regulated process that involves a very well-studied signaling pathway that involves nitric oxide, involves PGC1-alpha, which is a transcriptional coactivator, that are going to regulate both the production of proteins encoded by genes in the nucleus and the production of the few proteins that are encoded by mitochondrial DNA. Now, a few years ago, looking at mitochondrial biogenesis was all the rage in the literature, and people were looking at both the expression levels of PGC1-alpha, and also at one or two markers of mitochondrial presence. However, I think in the more recent years, people have begun to notice that really you can't talk about mitochondrial biogenesis as a blanket term. What is mitochondrial biogenesis? One or two components are not going to tell you how much mitochondrial mass you have, because mitochondria are actually not always the same. You have about 1,500 proteins in mitochondria, and the expression and control of these different proteins is not going to be the same all the time. You can actually have an increase in lipid oxidation proteins without a lip an, an increase in mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation proteins, for example. So really, mitochondrial biogenesis is a blanket term that really doesn't express the complexity of generating components of mitochondria. And the truth is that the different pathways are going to be regulated in different manners. So just measuring one or two parameters is not going to tell you how much mitochondrial activity there is because mitochondrial activity is not a very specific term. Um, having said that, to generate more mitochondrial mass involves a coordinated control of mitochondrial and nuclear proteins, lipids, and also the replication of mitochondrial DNA, because we have many, many copies of mitochondrial DNA per cell. Remember always that most mitochondrial proteins are encoded by nuclear genes. Only 13 components of mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, protein components of mitochondrial uh, oxidative phosphorylation, are encoded by mitochondrial DNA. The rest of those 1,500 proteins that mitochondria express are encoded in the nucleus. And that means that these proteins have to be imported into mitochondria. Importing proteins into mitochondria requires transporters of these proteins into mitochondria, and these transporters are the TIM and TOM system. So TOM stands for the transporter of the outer mitochondrial membrane, and this is a transporter that's going to recognize these proteins that have a target sequence that targets them towards mitochondria. It's going to recognize this target sequence. It's going to transport these proteins into the intermembrane space with the N-terminal and its positive charge on this N-terminal first. 
Then the rest of the transport is going to happen through TIM, which is a transporter of the inner membrane. Um, and TIM often is uh, related structurally to TOM, forming a super complex. And actually, TIM and TOM can be in those contact sites between the inner and the outer mitochondrial membrane. TIM is going to transport this protein into mitochondria, and this transport is dependent on the inner mitochondrial membrane potential, which is actually going to attract this positive charge of this N-terminal of this unfolded protein. Within mitochondria, each protein actually has a different story in terms of how it's going to be uh, further changed in mitochondria. We have matrix proteases, which cleave these target sequences frequently. There are different assembly factors. Different proteins have different locations in mitochondria. These proteins may actually be further exported to the intermembrane space, or they may be inserted in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So different proteins, different processing, but basically Tim and Tom are going to bring most of the proteins into mitochondria that form mitochondria. So we saw how mitochondria are generated in a nutshell. We saw how the proteins enter mitochondria, but mitochondria also have to eliminate parts of them that don't work well, and we call that mitochondrial turnover. Frequently when we talk about mitochondrial turnover, we think of mitophagy and elimination of full mitochondria, and that's an important process. But actually mitochondria have quality control mechanisms that happen before that. For example, mitochondria have proteases that degrade unfolded proteins within them, and therefore you don't have to throw out the whole mitochondrion, you're just degrading that one protein that lost its structure. Mitochondria can also throw away cargo that doesn't work anymore. Uh, this is mainly from Heidi McBride's group. They managed to characterize that mitochondria form vesicles that they call MDVs, mitochondrially derived vesicles, that eliminate cargo, that eliminate lipids and proteins that have lost their function, that are modified in some manner. So instead of eliminating the whole mitochondrion, just eliminating a small part of this mitochondrial lipid and mitochondrial proteins, and these vesicles are then targeted to degradation, for example, at the lysosome. But we also have processes of mitophagy, Mitophagy is a process in which a mitochondrion is eliminated. And that specific mitochondrion is going to be eliminated when there's something wrong with that mitochondria. Uh, generally, this is signaled by a low membrane potential or by oxidative modification of this mitochondrion, for example. Um, in order for mitophagy to happen, you have to have fragmented mitochondria. This mitochondria can't be part of this whole network. So mitophagy requires mitochondrial fission. And in fact, if you eliminate mitochondrial fission in a cell, if you take away the machinery for fission, you eliminate mitophagy. Generally what happens, and this is also in a nutshell, is that LC3 co-localizes with mitochondria. There's an activation of the pink one Parkin system and ubiquitination of the surface of mitochondria. This leads to the formation of isolation membranes and a mitophagosome, which is then going to be degraded um, through lysosomal enzymes, removing this mitochondrion that doesn't function anymore. Having said that, mitochondrial mito mitophagy has been studied mostly under very artificial situations. So mitophagy has mostly been characterized under conditions in which the membrane potential is forcefully decreased by mitochondrial poisons, or in which very overt oxidative damage is promoted in mitochondria. So we still have to understand more of what regulates mitophagy physiologically within the cell. The difficulty here being that this is not a phenomenon that's very easy to study because physiological mitophagy happens once in a while with one little mitochondrion, while when you treat the cells with a poison that decreases the membrane potential, you're going to have much more mitophagy and the, the effects are much easier to detect. So we saw how mitochondria are formed, we saw how mitochondrial damaged components can be eliminated. Another process that's necessary for mitochondria is that they be transported around the cell. So mitochondria can be trafficked around the cell, mitochondrial transport exists, 
And this is necessary, as we saw before, for dynamics of mitochondria. If you're going to have fusion, two mitochondria have to meet, therefore they have to be transported. And also for distribution of mitochondria. Uh, and because of distribution, mitochondrial traffic has been studied mostly in neurons. And in neurons, actually, mitochondria have to be transported very, very long distances uh, because you have mitochondria going down the axon. So this is really an important cell in which mitochondrial traffic has to happen. Mitochondria are transported on tracts, which are the microtubules, and they need motors. Um, mainly kinesins, such as KIF-5, have been characterized as important motors to take mitochondria to the end of the axon. Dynins also participate in mitochondrial trafficking, mainly bringing mitochondria back in retrograde transport. Retrograde transport in axons happens mainly with mitochondria that are old and damaged, while mitochondria going to the axon tend to be mitochondria that have newly formed components. Mitochondria also are transported on actin filaments, and that shows us that myosin uh, also acts as a motor in mitochondrial transport. There are also proteins that are accessory to mitochondrial trafficking, such as Miro and Milton, and problems in these proteins have been related to neurological diseases and been related to lack of mitochondrial transport. Excessive calcium inhibition, uh, uh, concentrations also inhibit mitochondrial traffic. So too much calcium and loss of calcium homeostasis in a cell will affect mitochondrial transport. Now, if mitochondria are transported all around the cell, they can relate to different organelles in the cell. And there are actually studies that show that mitochondria interact with every single organelle in the cell. But mitochondria really do have a special relationship with the ER. And this relationship is not only physical, there's not only a physical and close interaction between these two organelles, as this electron microscopy shows quite clearly. You can actually see tethers between the ER and mitochondria, which are formed by specific proteins. Um, but also there's a functional importance of the relationship between mitochondria and the ER. There's an exchange of phospholipids. In fact, the phospholipid composition of the outer membrane in mitochondria and the ER membrane is very similar. This is important to form specific phospholipids. And there's also an exchange of signaling, such as calcium signaling. So calcium in the ER could be released and taken up by mitochondria. We'll see the machinery of mitochondrial calcium uptake in our next classes. And also mitochondria can be determined for how much calcium is inside the ER, so it happens both ways. This relationship, both physical and functional, between the ER and mitochondria is altered in many different metabolic conditions and also in disease conditions. So it's an important relationship in terms of cell function and cell signaling. Uh, the tethering proteins involved in the relationship between the ER and mitochondria are being studied because of that, because mitochondria have this relationship with the ER that's functional. And interestingly, there are proteins involved in mitochondrial dynamics and mitochondrial fusion that are also involved in tethering with the ER. So this process of bringing together membranes, both mitochondria to mitochondria and mitochondria to the ER, involves some similar proteins. So as I mentioned before, this relationship between the ER and mitochondria is important for calcium signaling. And actually, mitochondria participate in many forms of calcium signaling in the cell. Mitochondria can shape the signals of calcium within the cell and can also determine how much calcium there is within the cell by uh, accumulating calcium in their matrix. And mitochondria can actually accumulate very large quantities of calcium in the matrix through mechanisms we will see later. Mitochondria participate in signaling in many different ways. There's also retrograde signaling for mitochondria, so regulation of nuclear uh, transcription by signals that come from mitochondria, such as reactive oxygen species, calcium we just talked about, energy levels, and redox levels. Also classically, mitochondria form ATP, and therefore are going to be determinant in the energy status of the cell. 
Therefore, mitochondria are going to be very determinant in any signaling processes involving AMPK, which is a sensor of the energy level in the cell. And finally, mitochondria are also going to be very determinant in the activities of mTOR, which is a kinase that's going to determine basically signaling mechanisms that regulate metabolism in very, very different manners. Many different signaling pathways that involve metabolism regulation are going to be regulated by mTOR. Mitochondria also participate in apoptosis. Uh, the finding that mitochondria participate in apoptosis in the mid-90s actually led to an increase in the interest in mitochondria in signaling in the cell that has resulted in about 7,000 papers a year being published today about mitochondrial biology. Um, so very, very rich signaling pathways involve mitochondria, very diverse. I'm not going to talk about that. But what we're going to talk about in this course is how to measure mitochondrial function so that you can continue to contribute to all these understandings of signaling pathways that mitochondria are involved in. And we're going to do that in our next lesson. We're going to start looking at how to measure mitochondria both in isolated mitochondrial situations and also in situations in which cells and tissues are permeabilized so you can study the mitochondria in situ within these permeabilized tissues. So see you then.